welcome to the Totally Awesome Fishing Show, where in this episode we are down at Nigel Jackson's stretch of the river test called Testwood. It's in Hampshire, and for those who want to know, we are river trout fishing. Well, at least we're trying. We're going to try it today. Now, we get asked by a lot of people to do some stuff on the rivers. Now, English rivers are not what they were, no question of that. In fact, only recently I was read up, before I came down here, I read up about the river test and there was somebody quoting that on average over the last I think it was 40 years the main lower part of the river test had dropped something like two feet two feet on a sort of national average if you like that's a catastrophic amount of water that is either not coming in rain or is not coming through the underground aquifers and also the thing I learned was that they actually infill some of the edges of the banks and don't cut the weed to boost that water to keep that water level up otherwise it would just skinny water fishing anyway a sort of a digression but I feel you ought to know that that the river test one of the world famous places to go trout fishing has changed over the years possibly a little bit harder hopefully Nigel stretches stretch here is is, is going to show us uh, something different with a few fish in there now then river fishing is nothing like lake fishing and there's a nice big lake with some big trout just behind me here that Nigel runs as you know, part of his trout fishery complex of Sutton Springs but a river is moving all the time a lake is still if you make a mistake on a lake you can pick off cast again or you can strip the line tight and maintain a constant constant contact with the fly with river fishing the minute your fly line hits the water it's moving so if you make a mistake it's going to spook the fish you have to get your cast almost perfect that's why River fishing is deemed slightly more difficult. Well, I suppose there's a bit more kudos to it, really. And certainly there's absolutely no question there's a bit more skill to it. I'm not saying I am the expert in river fishing. I do okay. I winkle the odd fish out here and there. But I don't do enough of it to consider myself. In fact, there is no thing as, such thing as an expert in fishing, let's face it. We're all learning all the time. Now, this river, I'm here right at the back end of autumn. It's very, very low. One of the driest years we've ever experienced in England. So I know it's going to be tough. I'm going to try and point out some of the swims that you should be getting trout lying in. Whether we get to see any there, I don't know. We'll try it with the camera, so at least you get some tips and some little well, techniques. Maybe we'll run through a few different flies. Now, on rivers, one of the famous things they like talking about is dry fly fishing. Well, I'm 99% sure we're not going to get any action on a dry fly today. It's nice and muggy. I'll tell you what it's good for, pike fishing. I uh, should be pike fishing today, but there's going to be little or no insect life unless the sun comes out very foggy at the moment so that sort of damp air is going to keep all the insects down i don't think it's going to be any hatches forget dry fly the other thing you need to know is you can do wet fly drown downstream on some rivers not here that's casting down now if you make a mistake downstream the pull of the current pulls your fly line out any mistakes no problem it pulls it all nice and tight and of course you can actually Bring your fly in front of fish. It's fishing all the time. It looks like a little insect struggling against the current. Now that's sort of easy fishing. They do it in a lot of wild rivers. It's, it's just called wet fly downstream, standard. But on the chalk streams, I find most of the rules and regulations are you've got to fish upstream only. So a lot more skill involved in getting the fly to go upstream. As I say, I'm no casting expert. I'm gonna do my best I can to show you anyway. And the other thing is, dry fly or nymph, depending on times of year, you have to check your rules and regulations on each fishery. Dry fly we're not going to be doing today, we're going to be doing upstream nymph fishing, see if we can find some fish. That's enough talking for me, I want to get down and see, it's beautiful and clear but it's very, very low. Nice hat, pair of glasses, I'm going to be using no big bulky lures or anything like that, just like a shrimp. So what I'm going to be using, I'm going to start with a shrimp. Now I'm probably going to go through the old fly box today because I know it's going to be a bit tough. But Nigel assures me by starting downstream and working up. That's another tip actually. The Gazette. Thank you Nigel for telling us that. If you start on a river and you start fishing upstream, every time you move downstream you're going to be spooking any fish that are laying below you. So when you're river fishing, go to the bottom end of the beach, start from there and work your way up. So the fish, don't forget, are laying their face into the current. So if you're coming from behind them, they won't see you, they won't spook. That's the theory, let's put it into practice. I'm off down the river. Now when you walk down a river, try and keep a good berth. You've got to walk downstream, so keep well away from the side that you're gonna fish from. Now, depending on whether you're right or left-handed, 
you might want to fish on the right or left hand bank. Now, my problem, my dilemma today is, as I'm looking at the river downstream, as it's flowing downstream, I want to cast on the right hand side of the downstream because I'm right handed. On the other hand, the better visibility I'm going to get is from the opposite bank because the light, which little light there is coming through this cloud today, is coming from behind me. So I'm going to go down and have a look, but I might have to change banks depending on what visibility I've got and how I can actually approach those trout. Okay, now I've already seen several smaller sized trout moving around and I've got one that's what they call laying on station. It's lying, lying on station. It's in the current. It's got streamer weed or ranunculus weed. It's got all the weed around it, bright green weed. And it's got a clear patch of gravel. And it's waiting there. I'll just try and get it on the camera for you if I can. It's laying, nice trout, it's a good trout. I guess he's about two and a half, three pounds. He's laying on station and he's got a narrow channel of weed it's got weed bed this side, weed bed that side, and that food's going to get funneled down that weed channel straight to his nose, and that's where you want to drop the fly. You can even afford to drop the fly over the weed, you know, the lead is touching the weed, so that shouldn't spook him, and he hopefully would just see the nymph come past his nose. But he's just lying there, and it's a classic position for casting upstream to a trout with you standing downstream. Well, before I start, I have to tell you guys, I've seen quite a few rainbow trout here. I've seen a few grayling dotting around, but two very, very big trout. One I filmed back up there, another one's down here. This one looks like it might be a sort of a cock rainbow. And it's laying there on station. It's a bit, oh man, it's a big fish. I would say, I don't want to say how big it is because nobody will ever believe me because I've got polarizing glasses on and I can see it. But, you know, if you take these off, I don't think you're going to see it at all. I'll try it anyway. He's a good fish. He's laying there on stage. We're going to try down here at the bottom in first. And then I'm going to change flies. I've got a feeling a dark fly might go. So I'm starting with that shrimp at the bottom. And then I might have to change flies. So I don't really want to spook this guy. Check it out. It's a nice fish. You can see how this big rainbow trout is lying on station in an ideal position to intercept any insects coming down in the current. And note it's at the back of this gravel bed, not at the front. Now as for tackle, I'm gonna be using a nine foot six, number seven, American rod with a 40 year old cracked old fly line. I've got a floating line and an old, I think it's an old intrepid rim fly. So ancient antique tackle. Nine foot leader of six pound pro gold, just straight nylon, no tapered leaders. But I have got some washing up liquid in here and I've degreased the first two or three feet. Now, you don't always have to degrease the whole of a nine foot leader, and I'll tell you why. If the whole nine foot leader sinks, which it will do if you degrease it, as you go to pick the line off the surface of the water for the next back cast to make another throw, because river fishing is just picking up, let the fly come down below the fish. Don't pick it up and tear the line off the surface over the fish's head. Pick it up down about level with you, work it a couple of times and just send it upstream again. If I let all the leaders sink, it might drag and tear through that surface film a little bit too much. I want to pick it off clean if I can, so I degrease, say about two or three feet. Because the chances are in this current, this tiny fly, although it has some under, under here some copper wire to uh, give it some weight to get down. It's not going to get down really deep. It's very, very shallow here. I need to get down maybe a foot. So always degrease the first couple of three feet of your leader. I've started right at the bottom of the beat, just upstream from the bridge. The water is too shallow to hold fish in front of me, so there's no danger of me spooking anything but I can start to work my casting upstream and hopefully cover some of the trout from my downstream position before they can see me. All it takes is one small grayling to spook and go racing upstream to set all the trout on red alert. So move carefully, slowly and keep watching through the water for any sign of a trout. They'll most likely be lying dead still in one position 
Right, there's no fish in this bit that I haven't spooked anyway with my practice casting. So what I just want to tell you, just have enough line. Don't peel yards and yards and yards of line off your reel. It's all going to go around your feet. You just want enough to go about 20, 30 feet to the fish. So you're going to have to get quite close to the fish, but not so close that you spook them. And when you make your cast, look for the little plip where the fly actually goes in, where the nymph lands, and you can just extend or shorten it accordingly, depending on how close you are to the fish, whether the fish is spooked or whether you want to try it again, etc. Now, what I find is when you make your cast, the current's going to pull the line straight back towards you. You're going to have slack laying all over the place. So if you keep it to a fairly short distance, what you do is you follow, make the cast, and then rather than strip line in to catch up with it and work it all out again, if you lay your arm back, follow the current at the same speed without moving the fly, flick it up, a couple of false casts, and you're back out to cover the fish again. So if you keep it fairly short, instead of stripping loads of line in and then casting it all out, because all that arm movement might spook the fish. If you just make your cast, as soon as you hit surface, I'm following it back all the time. I'm, I'm literally following it back with my rod. And when I get to about 90 degrees and I'm out of the fishing zone, I don't spook it, I can flick it up. A couple of false casts. Always watch your back cast as well. And you're just going to repeat that over and over until you either get a take, spook the fish, or you decide it's not going to take and you move on. Now, two more tiny little tips before I actually do take a shot at one of these trout that's lying up here. You're going to get different current speeds, you're going to get swirls around the weed beds, and they're going to put S shapes in the line. So I try and get round that by as I throw the line, if they get a bit of a belly in it, I throw some little spirals just with a rod top with a, a little flick of the wrist to try and what they call mend that fly line before it gets to the trout. I don't want to be mending that when it's right in the trout's face because if I flick it and it jerks the fly, he might not take it. So I'm going to do this. Coming back and just flick off the weed like this. I'm flicking, I'm rolling the line back upstream. Just a couple. Bring it back up, out again. And just a little, couple of little flakes, that's all it takes to keep. What it does is stops the belly getting into the line with the current and accelerating it. If you get a belly in it, it'll accelerate. If it looks too fast, the fish won't take it. Now, another little tip for you. So how do you get the take? If you're in a lake, you're stripping in like this, invariably, bang, you get a pull the other way. That's not generally gonna happen. It does occasionally in river fishing. They come up, they take the fly, they go back down on station, like I showed you those, just laying in station on the gravel. And they're not gonna zoom out all over the river. The only time they zoom around is when they're spooked. Right. So what you wanna do is just watch the fly leader where it joins the fly line. The tip of the fly line is going to be your target. If it tugs, if it stops, and it's near the fish strike, it could be a trout. Got him on. Got the fish on. Got the fish on. I had to change flies. See if I can get him downstream. Digging and digging for the wee beds. There you go, he's going upstream now. Man, is he digging. I'll tell you what, he's a big fish. If I get a chance, I'm going to net it straight away. Get back in the car park in a minute. There we go, people. Oh, he's still frisky. Oh, about 11 pound rainbow. Catch and release down here on the river test. A fantastic fish, fantastic scrap. I got lucky. Let's get it back in the water. Beautiful fish. Oh. Now, fish in the river always need recovering properly. So we're just gonna let this one rest in the car and get some oxygen over his gills. And normally, all trout fishing is not catch and release, especially with really big fish like this. But hopefully, cold water in the autumn, 
This one should be okay, should swim away. Just hold him like that, there we go. That is, that is a beautiful fish. That is a beautiful fish. I'm gonna keep him in the side here, just so he recovers slowly. And you can see his gills go in there. He's had a heck of a scrap. And just make sure they don't roll over and he should go away. You can see him getting the oxygen back in. He's recovering now. Just keep him up the right way. Well, there we go, people. What I've done is I've just pegged this one down like we used to with Barbel. I've used my pole that I put my underwater camera on just to peg it with the net handle and let him recover slowly and make sure the oxygen goes over his gills and he goes away. There we go, he's just laying there recovering. Whew. Heart's pounding, let's go and find another one for you. I tried a few casts for those shrimps, nothing, and I got that one actually on a pearly daddy. And I've seen there's another big rainbow over under the trees. I don't think I can get to him. There's a second fish in a gap just up here. So this is obviously at the bottom end of the fishery where it's a little bit deep under these low water conditions. A lot of ripples, a lot of little miniature rapids at the top. They're very, very shallow and they know that. So they feel unwary because herons and stuff like that. But there's two fish I'm gonna target here. I think I'm gonna stick with this fly, but I can see there's all sorts of bits of line hanging off this tree. That tells me other anglers have lost snags up there, in the snags up there, but it also tells me they've seen fish in there as well, otherwise they wouldn't be casting. And the fish know this, that's why the trout are laying under those trees. I'm going to work my way upstream. I can't, I can't risk losing the fly under there. The trout are there, but this, that's the reason the other guy's got snagged up is because it's just too tight a pocket to cast into. I'm going to try this guy up here. Lot of trees, lot of overhangs, and that's what makes river fishing a little bit different to other fishing. A lot of small trout or small grading in there. I'm right in one of those channels. Fly might be a little bit big for the grayling. No, he's spooky, but what I have noticed is they've moved to the other side. And this is double bank fishing. I can fish from both sides. So I shall mentally mark these two areas here as potentials for going and fishing on the other side. We've had no takers in that last sort of 30 yard stretch there. So I've come away from the trees, but I have remembered where those trout are because they will lie on station there. I'm going to come back around and approach them from the other side as well. I'm now working my way up, systematically up, working through the upstream stretches, always looking all the time to try and spot a trout before it spots me and present it with a fly. So I'm looking at some clear gravel patches up there, one big fish up there, two or three smaller ones. I'm gonna give that one a go, work my way up until I run out of space. You just gotta keep working away. Now what you do is if you go through a beat or a stretch, you've also got the other side to approach it from. If that's, you know, if you've got double bank fishing, as you have here, or just give it a rest for about 15, 20 minutes, go and have a flask of tea, some sandwiches, sit in the car, just sit in the riverbank. Let them all calm down and you can go down the bottom and work your way through again. And very often you'll pick up another fish at the bottom end where you didn't to start with. Obviously, you don't want to thrash it to death. That's the main thing is if they don't take, if they spook, rest them. Let their memory forget you even there and you might approach them and get another one. I'll change again, guys. I've got a white chomper on this time to get it down so I can see what happens. Big rainbow just turned out, he's coming down right in front of me here. Beautiful fish, beautiful fish. Let's see if I can get it close enough to you so you can see it. 
it's just sucked it back straight down the hatch. There he is. He's got it right in the scissors. He's just locked in the scissors there. Yeah, beautiful looking fish, beautiful looking fish. Right, let's see if we can get him in the net for you. That's enough pussyfooting around with the camera, guys. Come on, come on. Come on. There he is. Let's get him up. What I'll do is lead him upstream, and then I'm going to draw him back into the net using the flow of the river, hopefully. As he, as he comes down, hopefully I can swim him into the net. Oh, it's another lump. It's another Nigel Jackson special. My goodness me. Let's get this one in really quickly. Just to show you. I'm just going to flap around a bit. There is the white chomper right in the scissors, corner of his jaws. And you know I was lucky to get this one? because he's blind on one side. He must just have seen it on the one side from the one eye. That fish, I don't know, seven pounds of anybody's money in a river on a small nymph. Whew, let's get it back. So it's really important, guys, to get these fish back in the water quickly. I've got that one recovering in the net because don't forget this is catch and release rainbow trout fishing. It's not bang everything on the head, Slaughterville. Catch and release is different. You've got to look after the fish a bit more. And I'm going to use one of my poles to try and peg him out to recover him in the current. He's going to go. Is he going to go? Get him head in the current. Always get the head in the current. Yeah, he looks good to me. He looks good to go. Well, this is how I can tell you that river fishing, big rainbows from a river, are not easy. But you know what, are they worth it? I think so, don't you? It's tough fishing. Well, you say it's tough fishing. Obviously, they have to be stopped in the river. There's more fish moving down there. Look at that lot. You can see them down there moving on the surface, and that's under the trees. Fish everywhere down that bottom end. And this guy's recovering. And you can see him just down there. Just let him recover slowly, and he'll be fine. But you've got to do it quickly. You've got to get him back. What a beautiful trout and what conditions to fish in. Have you seen a few tips there? I'm off to have some lunch. I shall return down to those trees and see if I can winkle just one more out for you. Beautiful fishing. A couple more tips for you here uh, if you want a, a couple of extra tips over there there's a sluice and a side stream coming in there just a small side stream that's going to be held back by the sort of sluice gate the bars of wood there so it's going to be a lot of oxygen tumbling over the top there the sluice is there not for the oxygen it's to hold the water up in the lake oxygen there nice clean gravel as you can see it's washed clean and that's below that should be some trout so anywhere there's a side stream coming in a little bit of different flow creates some sort of feature always look below that for a holding spot for a trout. Here's another little tip. Some of these have double ratchets on them, these reels, and they can be somewhat audible, which is what they are for. Oh dear, oh dear, it's like a parrot. It's like a macaw. Very nice if you have a screaming eight pound bonefish on the end, but can be a little bit trying. So what I do is they've got little triangles there, little 
ratchets, I just I can either switch one off or I can switch both off like that. If I switch both off, spool goes back on. Then listen, Ooh, totally silent. That's nice. And of course, I don't just pull it. I'm controlling the rim. That's probably why it's called a rim fly. With my thumb there, just on the outside, prevents any overrun. And if I want to palm it with a fish, I can do it. If I want to wind in, I can wind. And of course, I can what they call bat the reel. To get all the loose line up quickly so I can get on the fish quickly and then fight it off the reel. But always just retain that thumb just on the edge of the rim. So you, you can do that, but what I do is I just leave it on one clicker for the moment. How long that takes? Seconds. Leave it on one. Not quite so noisy because such pristine surroundings here in peace and quiet. I really, you know, don't want to be woken up like an alarm clock, do I? Well, well I've come down the bottom end of the fishery I'm on the opposite bank to where I hooked those other fish before. And the overhanging trees that I thought were overhanging this side, actually there's a bit of a gap there. And when I look, it's full of fish. Take a look at this. Have a look here. Turn this camera around if you can see them. Down in there, in amongst the shadow lines, they're happy in that shade, you see. And I'm happy because I can see the fish. I know they're in there. I'm a little bit unhappy because I have no idea how I'm going to get a cast to them, even if one's going to take. But we've got to give it a shot, as they say. Just look at how you can spot this trout by looking into the shadow cast on the water from the tree. It provides a narrow window of viewing, and that's all the angler needs to visually locate a fish. And look carefully and you'll actually see there's three fish lying there. If you can't see the trout under the surface, look for signs of a rise, even from a small fish. It tells you something is in that pool. And you can bet your last fly that if I put the camera down and picked up the fly rod that the giant rainbow would be gone. Now here's a tip, look at how this trout lies with its tail just upstream of this boulder. It's a classic holding position, in front of the stone or boulders, not behind it. Salmon lie like this all the time. I believe there's a pressure point in the current directly in front of that rock or stone, so remember it. Just look at how polarising glasses cut down the reflective surface glare and let you see right through the water. If you fish for trout visually, you must have them, as well as for the safety aspect when casting. And shut that light out even more by wearing a cap or hat with a good peak. The more you can see of the trout, the better you can approach it with that delicate cast. It doesn't even look like a rainbow, this one. Might be grayling. Oh. What is that? Oh. Well, they're so different. Haven't got the grayling, but got what looks like a very, very thin, possibly spawned out brown trout. Very thin, very 
out of condition, so I guess that's a spawned out one. And for that reason, there's a brown trout. Let's get it back. That's showing you some tips on river fishing, giant rainbows, and the old brown trout as well. And I did lose a grain that I didn't tell you about. That's the end of the Totally Awesome Fishing Show for this episode. Tips on rivers. Let's get this guy back. Just on the way back, and another fish, big one. Just to the absolutely the smallest nymph I've got in my box. Absolutely. I plugged and plugged and plugged away at it, and it finally took it. I want to get this one in quickly. If Nigel puts more trout this size in there, there's no space left for the water. That's just about eight pounds. Eight pounds of prime River Tess rainbow trout. Beautiful. Let's get him straight back in the water. What a lump. And then I'll show you the fly. So this guys is the fly, I'm going to put it in the top of my rub butt here so you can see it. I just going home, said all the goodbyes to you people, but you know what it's like, you've got to have a few casts on the way back to the car. And I'll put this tiny, if you could just see that tiny little, it's almost like we call it a speck fly. It's about, it's not an 18, it's about size 16. It's got weight here, little white thorax, red head. And basically it's the smallest thing I had in my fly box. And I thought well, I'd try it and catch you at a grayling on the way home. No, giant rainbow, God almighty, eight pounds I should think. What a day's fishing, well what, just half a day's fishing. So there you have a few tips, trout fishing on a river, might just help you get that odd extra fish. This was on the river test, it is good fishing here, if you ever get the chance, or you get an invite, or you, you want to try it, try it, because it is good. Failing that, those techniques still work for ordinary trout, pound, two pounds, pound and a half, three quarters of a pound, they still hold good for when you're fishing small streams, small rivers, anywhere in the British Isles. Till next time, tight lines. Well, not tight in bushes or snags, obviously. You know what I mean, though.